Good afternoon, everyone. I think, I think we will get started. Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson. I want to welcome all of you here uh, today. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Alma, as always, for support of these series. And uh, our guest today needs no introduction, not only in Washington, but probably in any city or even the most remote hamlet in the United <laughs> States, because I think everyone feels. How about the world? Or the world, <laughs> the world, the most remote hamlet in the world. And, uh, and of course, really, you have a brief introduction. And all I want to do, for those of you who, who weren't there or hadn't read it, is simply read this from the citation when she won the National Humanities Medal two years ago. To Diane Rehm for illuminating the people and story behind the headlines, in probing interviews with everyone from pundits to poets to presidents, Ms. Rehm's keen insights and boundless curiosity have deepened our understanding of our culture and ourselves. And this book, and she's been busy signing copies, and uh, she needs to go off and catch a flight just after this. So uh, rather than signing the copies after, she signed them before. So those of you who haven't read it yet, you'll have a copy uh, with, her, with her signature, uh, is uh, you know, extraordinarily moving, deeply personal, and candid story about bereavement, mortality, meaning, marriage, love, just about every emotion I think there is. And it's also about uh, the right to die, or as she will tell us in her, our conversation, as she likes to call it, the right to choose, uh, death with dignity, uh, uh, which is a topic that she is going to be devoting a great bit, bit of her time to after she retires from NPR at the end of the year. So one question those of you probably are asking already who come to many of our book talks is, why is my wife sitting here? And the reason that my wife, Jessica Hurstein, is here is very simply because when we asked Diane whether we could do a book talk with her, her condition was that she interview with me. And uh, uh, the reason for that is that Jessica's uh, uh, late parents were uh, how shall I say, uh, friends of, of Diane and, and John uh, for most of their lives. Classmates. Classmates at Harvard. Harvard. Classmates John at Harvard and, and close friends all of their lives. And I think that will come up uh, perhaps in our conversation. And, and also, I think the fact that Jessica, who, who recently lost both of her parents and her father more recently and was very close to, there is also obvious parallels there on the topic of, of bereavement and grief. And, uh, and finally, as a physician, the other topic, uh, which is relating to death and dying, is obviously of enormous importance to someone who is a uh, physician. Uh, but don't worry, even though there are two of us, we're not going to take twice as long with the questioning. And we're going to give you plenty of time to ask questions That's yourself. Good. That's good. So, let, let me start, actually, in just observing sort of the obvious, which is that it is unusual, if not intimidating, to be interviewing someone who interviews people for a living <laughs> and, and does it perhaps better than anyone Thank in the world. You, but it must be, Diane, a bit odd, although you've done other books, of course, which are wonderful, but this one you're going all around the country talking mm -hmm. about it, to be on the other side of an interview. And are there things that you have learned or observed being the subject of interviews? Elliot, I am, first of all, so pleased to have been invited to speak here at the Aspen Institute, most especially to have the two of you interview me. And thank you, Alma, for sponsoring these talks. Um, I really am quite comfortable, indeed rather relieved, to be on the other side of the <laughs> microphone. I don't have to think about what next question I'm going to pose or whether uh, my guest seems comfortable or uncomfortable 
or prepared to answer the next question. I can just be here and enjoy being here. Well, we're Thank very you. glad. <laughs> Thank you. Diane, it's such an honor to be sitting here with you. Oh, yes. I, thank, I thank you for, for coming and for, for putting up with both of us. Um, my father, in his final days, when he knew he was dying, and he too chose to give up treatment, he spoke about how important it was for him to connect with you. And one evening, uh, he said he was going to call you. When I came back with his dinner, he said he'd had a very special conversation with you. So, and you were indeed the last person who he called and the last person he spoke to outside of the immediate family. So I want to thank you for being there for him and for the long friendship that you shared. Oh my goodness, it was, I mean, your mother, a brilliant attorney, the first female head of the Hartford Law Review. Your father, a brilliant lawyer, uh, one of my husband's dearest friends. We were all together at the 50th Harvard reunion because Sean and your dad were classmates. And I can remember dancing with your father. So I was so touched when he called because I said, oh dear Bob, can I come see you? And he said, not today, maybe tomorrow. And I knew then that he would not be here tomorrow. I knew. And I said, oh, dear Bob, I love you. And he said, Diane, I love you so much. And that was the last. So I miss them both. Thank you. Reading your book, it brings home to me what we have both probably experienced in some way and many others, how individual the grieving process is. You talk about needing to give in to the sense of loss and also how difficult it is to ever really get closure. You don't have final closure. I don't believe in closure. Uh, so many television commentators or interviewers say, well, did you achieve closure? I'm getting a tiny bit of feedback on this microphone. I hope we can turn it down a little bit. She's an expert on microphones. Well, yeah, <laughs> if, if we could just turn it down. But I believe for myself, and I should not speak for everyone, I believe for myself that there will never be complete closure. I will always, always, forever miss John Rehm. I talk to him every day. It's been almost two years now, and I want you to know he talks back to me. <laughs> and as I sit in my studio um, recording for the morning's program, the uh, promos and the introduction, there is a big window behind me, so as I am waiting for the engineer to play back to me, I turn around, I look through that window, I look up at the cloud, and I talk to John. And sometimes he scolds me and says, you're doing too much, and you're trying to go too fast, but it's part of the grieving process. Mm -hmm. I think I have run as fast and as hard as I could away from grief. Mm -hmm. And work is how I do it. You know, I, I had uh, a similar reaction to your discussion about closure in the book, because I, I feel the same way you do. I mean, I lost my mother 
19 years ago, and there's not a day I don't think about her. And the notion that you can have closure about something like that, I find deeply, exactly. deeply troubling. But you know, there's another uh, aspect of the book. I mean, there's so many that speak to all of us in so many ways. But you, you speak about the fear of being alone. And, and there is a special dimension, I presume, of, with respect to the loss of a spouse. You were married for 54 years. And I, and you, I think you, you, you said in the book that you know, the team of Reem is no longer. Talk to us a little bit about that particular aspect of loss when it's to someone you have been a partner with for more than half a century. I'll back up a, a bit and say that I um, went from my parents' home, an Arab home. My father came here from Beirut, Lebanon. My mother came here from Alexandria, Egypt. So I am a pure Arab. Um, my mother died two months after I was married the first time. She wanted me to marry an Arab, which I did. I was 19. She died two months later, and my father died 11 months later of a broken heart. So I was 19. I was married for two years, and mine became the first divorce that the Arab American community here in Washington had ever seen. It was very difficult for me as it was for them. John Rehm and I were married in 1959. And it was a fabulous courtship and a wonderful time together for many years, with the exception of the fact that he worked constantly, like your father. Um, he, I mean, the whole notion of paternity leave or anything of that sort was not in existence. So I was a total homemaker for 14 years. And for three of those years, I had no car. So I was literally in the home and could not wait for weekends, those weekends that John Ream could be at home with me, with the children, to do the errands together, to get out of the house other than for walking the children within the neighborhood. John Ream was my attachment to the rest of the world. He was also my teacher. As I mentioned, he and Bob went together to Harvard. He had gone to Friends Seminary in New York on scholarship. He went from there to Harvard on scholarship, to Columbia Law on scholarship. I had no college education. So John Ream became my teacher. And that really formed the basis of that early relationship. And then, as time went on, 14 years into our marriage, I began to think, what's the rest of my life going to be like? These kids are going to leave me. And John's already, you know, so totally into his work. So I began as a volunteer at this tiny little radio station on the campus at the American University, which was not even a member then of NPR. As soon as you went off the curve, 
you lost the signal. <laughs> um, and we were in a little Quonset hut on the campus at AU. But before long, after my 10 months as a volunteer, then I was employed as a part-time worker, and then as a full-time worker, I began to radio programs of my own. Oh, I didn't realize I was up on the screen. My dress looks red. <laughs> it's very interesting. Um, and when my former boss retired, WAMU by this time had become an NPR member. I got the job after they had interviewed more than 100 people, which really surprised me because American University holds the license to WAMU, and my competition at the end was a woman who had gone not only to Harvard, but to graduate school as well. So I didn't think I had a chance, and then the gods smiled on me, and there I was, and here I am. So, so you and John had been through a lot of ups and downs. You're very Absolutely. open in your book. Um, but there was an incredible bond there. Mm. And at the end, after living for, I believe, over 10 years with Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. he made the personal decision that he wanted to die. Right. Now, it wasn't so easy to do that, but in the end, he did. He stopped eating and drinking. Now, you were still, it sounded like, enjoying some times together. You brought in an album and... Well, but the day before I brought that album in, John had asked for our daughter, who is a physician in Boston, she's at the Leahy Clinic, to be on the telephone. She had a he had asked our son, who is an academic at Mount St. Mary's University, to come down from <coughs> Gettysburg to be in the room with his doctor and me. And John opened the conversation by saying, I am ready to die. He said, I can no longer feed myself. I can no longer bathe myself. I can in no way take care of myself any longer. I have fallen into degradation, and I wish to go no further. I am ready to die. Dr. Freed, will you help me? And Dr. Freed, a lovely, wonderful, very empathic doctor, said to John, in the state of Maryland, I cannot legally morally or ethically help you die. And John said he felt betrayed. I think he had in his mind that somehow the doctor would be willing to simply give him pills or give him some kind of an injection that would end his life immediately. The doctor then said to John, he had already said to me, Diane, you are a public figure. Your husband is well known. Please, Diane, do not do anything to help your husband die. And I promised I would not, though John and I had had so many discussions in our marriage about helping each other die if we had reached a point where we felt life was no longer worth living. 
The doctor then said to John, the only thing you can do for yourself is to stop eating food, stop taking medication, and stop drinking water. Now, I'm sure you all know you can go a very long time without eating food, but you cannot go a very long time without drinking water. The organs begin to break down very, very quickly. As we left John's room that day, oh, and by the way, Jenny, our daughter, hollered to John, hit her father on the phone, and said, but Dad, we can keep you comfortable. And John said, I don't want comfort. I have fallen as far as I want to go into degradation. I will not go further. We left his room that evening. I came back the next day with a photograph album I had made for him of his infancy. He was born in Paris, lived the first six years there, all the way through French Seminary in New York. I got onto his bed. I looked at him. And I said, sweetheart, you look wonderful. His face was pink. He, he was smiling. He looked so healthy. He said, it's because I've not had anything to eat, anything to drink, and the nurses have been told not to bring me any medication. I have begun my journey. And I said to him, I sat on the bed with him, put my arm around him, and I said, sweetheart, are you sure this is what you want? And he said, absolutely. I am ready for the next journey. And it took him 10 days to die which was excruciating. I'm sure you were very respectful of his decision, but was, did you also feel a sense of abandonment? No, I did not. I felt a temptation on the third or fourth day when he had fallen into a very deep sleep and no one had given him any morphine as yet. I felt a very, I mean, I had to hold myself back. I thought, if I put just a touch of applesauce onto his lips, if I put a few drops of water onto his mouth and say, sweetheart, Please come back. Don't go. Don't go. We, we really, really want you to stay. I felt that temptation, and it was measured, balanced by my respect for his decision. The, <clears throat> you, you write in the book about some of the differences between long, protracted dying and sudden death. I think, I think you reference Joan Didion writing about the sudden death of her husband. And I think back, uh, and we all have memories like this, of my, my mother who had a very slow, difficult death from ovarian cancer. And the number of times she used to say to me and my siblings, you know, I wish I'd just get hit by a bus. <laughs> What, 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 what do you, what did you learn, or what do you think about the differences in, in maybe in the grieving process or otherwise between 
loss from sudden death and loss from a death that is anticipated for a long period of time? You know, um, two months or a, a month and a half after John went into assisted living, my dearest friend in the whole world, Jane Dixon, who was the Episcopal Bishop of the Diocese of Washington in Maryland. On Christmas night, younger than I, died in her sleep. She had had a big party the night before for her entire family at the building where we both lived and left her husband just totally bewildered, totally distraught, totally undone. There must have been 6,000, 7,000 people filling the cathedral at her memorial service because we were all so undone. She and I literally talked on the telephone every single day for 45 years. We had met each other at our church and we loved each other. We raised our children together. We lamented our various complaints about our children, our lives, our husbands, our work, you know. And she said to me one day on the phone, Diane, promise you won't laugh when I tell you what I want to be. And I said, of of course I won't laugh. And she said, I want to be a priest. And I said, Jane, you go for it. And John Walker was bishop at the time she got her first parish. And he stood at the pulpit and said, someday this woman will be a bishop. Wow. And there she did. She died. There I felt abandoned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought, how can you do this? I'd lost my husband to assisted living, and now I'm losing you. I had never really, I'll never, ever get over that. But here's what I want to say. And it's very important that I say this. John chose to die. I believe in the right to die. California has become the most recent state because the California Medical Association stood to the side and did not object to the legislature's passage of the right to die. Jerry Brown, in his signing statement, said, and I'm paraphrasing, I do not know, and this is a Jesuit speaking, he said, I do not know now what I would choose for myself at the end. What I do know is that I would not wish for someone else to make that decision for me. What I would like to see in this country is that each and every one of us has the right to choose, and by that, what I mean is, if you hold that God is the only being who can make that decision, 
for you. I support you 100%. If you decide that you want every treatment, every chemotherapy, every radiation therapy, and then all the palliative care possible, I support you 100%. And if you choose the right to die, I support you 100%. I believe that each of us as human beings is owed that right. We have no choice when we are born. We come into this world, we make our own decisions within the realm of the law. And at the end, I hope I have the right to die. I know I have the right to take my own life, but I hope that I shall have the right to have aid in dying. I believe in that very strongly. Well said. I know you're going to continue to be a strong voice in the next path you choose, um, it's partly related to death and, and dying, I guess. Indeed. Um, your writing is so personal, so touching, so emotional. It, it really stands out compared to most books we read on in any topic. Why did you decide to do that? And was it hard for you? You know, Jessica, I um, started writing this book the very night John was dying. Once he began that withdrawal from life, for two days he was buoyant, he was happy, he was alive. And then he began that fall into sleep. On the, I stayed there the entire time, except going back to the apartment to sleep. I stayed there every day for 10 days watching this man fall deeper and deeper and deeper into sleep. On that 10th night, I had the feeling he was going to go soon. So instead of going home, I put two chairs together next to his bed I got on the chairs and I put my little long-haired chihuahua on my stomach <coughs> to sleep with me. And of course I couldn't sleep. So at two o'clock in the morning, I had my iPad with me. And that's when I got up and started writing and I wrote with rage with rage to have you watch my husband go through 10 days of that kind of, I don't know whether he was suffering. I don't know what was happening to him internally, but I do know that I felt his suffering and felt how unfair it was. To him, So I put that into words, into my iPad. I wanted to express what I was seeing, what I was watching, what I was feeling. I was talking to the dog as I was writing. And I wrote probably until about 5.30 in the morning when two nurses came in, I'll never forget this, I was so angry. They came in to turn him. And I 
said to them, my God, what are you doing? Why can't you just leave him be? Well, they said, we don't want him to have bed sores. Mm -hmm. Well, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. That's why I wrote this book as personally as I did, Jessica, because I wanted people to know John. I wanted them to experience with me the understanding of what it is to go through that kind of debt. I wanted to put into it my own feelings about how I feel each of us deserves the right to choose. And John would have chosen medication to end his life quickly. And if laws and states <laughs> change, people will have those I rights. I think just California as may be a <clears throat> tipping point. Kelly. And of course, you write in the book of the Supreme Court of Canada decision. But I want to get back to the, the candor that Jessica talked about and, and the emotions I talked about that you write about in this book, because you write it, it very personally about all the range of emotions. You talk about rage, but you also write about guilt. And, and, and I was really struck by, by that. And, and the guilt earlier in his illness that you felt about not being able to take care of him for his last 18 months. And again, this is, it speaks to so many feelings other people have. I mean, the guilt my siblings and I feel about when we had to move my father into some kind of an assisted living in environment. Can you just talk to us a little bit about, about guilt and how it plays into all of this? I knew that I could not be the caretaker for John in his final years or days unless I completely gave up my work. I knew that our apartment could not hold an additional person 24 hours a day. But the guilt was mine because when we married, not everybody chose to use these words, but we married for better, for worse, in richer or poor, in sickness and in health. And I felt that the last night before we made the decision that John would go into assisted living, we were sleeping in separate rooms because Parkinson's disease had caused John to have a kind of jump every 10 seconds. And I would awaken with each of those movements. He was sleeping in a separate room, and at 3.30 in the morning, I woke up. I hadn't heard anything, at least consciously, but I went into the next room and found John on the floor in front of the bathroom. Everything you've heard about trying to lift another person is true. It's close to impossible. What I managed to do first was to get John onto his knees and then to pull him inch by inch back to his bed and then one limb at a time to get him finally back up on his bed. 
he immediately went back to sleep. By this time, it was 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. I had to get up at 5 o'clock, so I never went back to sleep. And as I was leaving for work the next morning, he said to me from his bed, I'm so sorry, Diane, I guess we need to talk. And I said, yes, I guess we need to talk. Mm -hmm. And we both knew what we were going to talk about. So the next day, I started researching assisted living facilities in the area. And John agreed. He said, it's time. And we found Brighton Gardens quite near to us, a lovely facility that looks like a residence from the outside, and found a lovely bright room. And I managed to get the same fabric that we had in his bedroom to create draperies for there and got <coughs> furniture. So it was a very comfortable room. But guilt does not leave you ever. Guilt says to me, sometimes in the middle of the night, Diane, why didn't you do that? Why couldn't you do that? And I can hear John Ream saying, sweetheart, stop. I can hear him saying that to me. Stop working. Stop. So guilt is part of it. Being alone is part of it. But you know, he used to say that being alone and being silent was like having a fresh drink of cold water. And because I am in the public so much now, I feel the same way. When I walk into my apartment and see my little dog come running toward me and know that that little dog and I are going to spend the evening together. Perfect. That's wonderful. And you were different all along. You oh talk about how social you were and how retiring totally. he was. Totally. Totally. You and he both faced chronic disease for a long time. Mm -hmm. Very difficult diagnoses, difficult management, um, interfering with your lives. Um, do you have lessons that you have learned that you can share with us for other people who face or will face similar challenges? I think um, what I have learned most of all is the idea of acceptance of where that person is along that path. I mean, I watched John when he moved into Brighton Gardens at first, uh, certainly being totally tuned in to the news, reading the newspaper, sharing stories with me as soon as I walked in every day. And slowly, 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 I saw that interest in the outside world mm. dissipate. And so I had to find other ways to <coughs> engage him. And I can remember bringing in a set of Scrabble. And I brought in a set of Monopoly. And for a little while, he was interested in that. And then slowly, that receded. And then he asked me to read to him. And so I began reading. And I said, well, what would you like? Because he didn't used to ever 
want me to read to him. I think he had heard enough of my voice. <laughs> um, so he asked for Jude the Obscure, which was a downer book. <laughs> so about two hours or five, six days into that, he said, enough already. <laughs> so then he asked me to read haiku to him. So I brought in a book of haiku and read those to him, and we loved those. He didn't want me to stop reading those. But finally, we just sat and talked about us and the amount of time we had wasted in our marriage. And makes me cry to think about it. Um, long marriages have ups and downs. And the reason I wrote about those downs as well as the ups is because there are no perfect marriages. There are no perfect people. And though we were married and stuck it out thank God, for 54 years, I never wanted to paint an unrealistic picture of what our marriage was because, and especially from the letters and notes I've gotten, I know that there are many people who share those feelings. Let me just stay on what Jessica was, was just asking, and, and that is co confronting a diagnosis of a disease with no cure. Right. I mean, for you, it was spasmodic dysphonia right. in 1998, I think. Right. And for John, it was Parkinson's in 2005. Right. And for many of us, we receive a diagnosis at some point when there's no cure. And often with that comes depression. Isn't there a risk, and how do you manage that risk, that people early in those diagnoses, if it were easier to choose death, if it were easier to choose death, isn't there a risk that some people might choose in the depth of a depression when they still have a long and happy future ahead of them? You know, I think you bring up a really good point. There was a situation where a person was diagnosed with a severe brain cancer and was told he only had six months to live and considered exactly that, suicide. And yet, somehow, a cure for the particular kind of brain cancer he had was found. And 20 years later, he was still alive. So of course, that risk exists. But that's why I so believe in choice. That man said, I decided to fight this. I decided I was going to try to obtain every possible treatment. And, and that's great. But depression is certainly a risk. John claimed he never had depression, which I don't believe for one minute because I do think he was depressed. But if he was, he would never take any medication for it. He simply reached that point of indignation at having to be fed. We had an Easter party the November before, I mean, the, uh, an Easter party. He died in November. Easter was in April. 
our daughter, her husband, our grandchildren, lots of friends, um, our son, his wife came, and John was seated at the head of the table. And we had the Easter brunch that we had had for 30 years at our home, when we would invite 40, 50 people and have everybody out on the patio and loving shrimp and all kinds of beautiful Easter food. And we made that brunch. And John could barely get that fork to his mouth. He finally put the fork down and would not eat anymore. I think he was embarrassed. And who could blame him? And so he then put his head down, his daughter sitting on his lap saying, Dad, would you like me to help you? And he said, no, thank you. So I think that that's how we have to honor and respect where each person is along the way of his or her illness. If it hadn't been for John, after I sat at home for four months, not being able to talk, finally speaking with our doctor, who said, we have to get her to Johns Hopkins. We have to find out if she has ALS or throat cancer. And within one hour at Johns Hopkins, they diagnosed me wow. with spasmodic dysphonia. I have injections into my very throat right there at the Adam's apple every four months. Um, and that has allowed me to stay on the air for all this time. And that was back in 1998. So in each case, I think you just have to be with that person and understand where that person is. Questions? Yes. Um, <laughs> Let us open it up. Uh, open the phones. Oh, we'll open the phones. <laughs> you don't need to dial, but you can please. Uh, we have microphones, because all of this is being recorded. So if you could just wait for me to recognize you and have a microphone brought to you. Yes, please, right here. And the microphone is going. Yes, my name is Nancy Berg. Thank you, Diane, for your many, many years on NPR and for this beautiful talk you've just given. Discussion. My question is about your next chapter and how you feel about going into it. I'm, I would have guessed mixed emotions and how you feel about leaving your career and starting this exciting next chapter. You know, I'm frankly very excited. My manager yesterday, well, he had already asked me to stay on at the station for as much or as little as I choose doing other things. Perhaps raising the profile of the station, perhaps raising money for the station. But yesterday he said, Diane, people still want to hear your voice. Are you willing to do a podcast? a weekly podcast. And I said, I'll think about it. <laughs> and I will think about it, because as I've traveled the country for the book, people have said to me, please don't give this up altogether. But the other thing is that I have already been invited to various places for 2017 
to speak on the issue of the right to choose. And I do intend to make that a major part of what comes next. But if I can manage to do a once weekly podcast on heaven knows what, uh, I may do that as well. I had the feeling that leaving the microphone, which is really all I'm doing, I'm stepping away from the microphone. I am not retiring. I do not believe in retirement for me. I mean, other people have other ideas, but I don't believe in retirement. Thank you for asking. There's yeah. a question over here. Sure. Uh, it's a thrill to be here with you, Diane. I've been thank a listener for many years oh, and thrilled you. to be here. Uh, I wanted to go back to the statement you made about writing. Uh, my name is Eugene Augustopher. I'm at Harvard as well, and psychologist. And there's a fair literature about the therapeutic value of writing. And so when you were talking about being angry and writing and so forth, I was curious about, you know, if you can make some statements about how the writing helped you with what you were going through in terms of grieving and bereavement, which, again, there's a fair amount of literature about that. So thank you. You know, I happen to have the world's finest editor, Bob Gottlieb, who was head of Knopf, head of the New Yorker, a published author. He writes for many publications and is now working on his own memoir. I've worked with him since my first book in 1998. So I called Bob and I said, Bob, I'd like to write a book not only expressing my own feelings of anger and sadness and longing and what's next, but I'd like it to be helpful to others, uh, to widows, to widowers, to anyone who's experienced a loss. Do you think this makes sense? And he said, I'd like you to write me a paragraph about what you want to accomplish here. I'm having lunch with Sonny Mehta, the head of Knopf on Monday, and I'll take it to him. He did, and Sonny said, fine. I found the writing difficult because I was really bearing my soul. And I remembered something that Bob had said to me when I was writing my first book, Finding My Voice. He and I used to talk on the phone at night. He's a late night person, I'm an early morning person. And I was asking him about something in particular. And I'll never forget his words. He said, Diane, you must think about exactly how much you want to reveal of yourself. Hung up the phone, went to sleep, and dreamt that night I was whitewashing my bedroom wall. <laughs> so it was, it was to me. And I had taken a writing class long, long time ago. And I remember the professor saying something to me like, you're holding back. And I can feel that in your writing. This time, I didn't hold back. And Bob kept pulling it from me. He is the sort of editor that everyone would love to have. You send him 20 pages by email, and in 10 minutes, he's called you back. 
and gone over every single word. So it was, it was a wonderful experience in the end. Hard writing, but a wonderful experience in the end. Question here. Sorry. First, I want to thank you, Diane. This was, uh, I've been to several, many, I should say, uh, book sessions here, and we've heard wonderful authors, but I never have heard a more affecting presentation than you've just given us, and thank you so much for that. But I wanted to say, in answer to Elliot's question, that um, I'm involved with an organization called Compassion and Choices. And we were the organization that really spearheaded the drive in six states to make uh, aid and dying legal. Starting in Oregon. Starting in Oregon. And that law prevents exactly what you were afraid of. You cannot just say, I'm very ill, I'm depressed, and I need the medicine because I want to die. That will not work. What you have to be is certified by your physician that you have six months to live uh, or less. And also a psychiatrist mm -hmm. will see you to make sure that you're of sound mind. If you are depressed, they will not grant you the right to take the medicine. So the, the Oregon law has become the model as each state comes into the fold on this issue, they go back to the Oregon law, and these safeguards exist. Quite right. So I, I think that's uh, a fear that a lot of people have. My children will want to get rid of me, and they might <laughs> give me the medicine. Well, you can't get it. Yeah. First of all, it's, that medicine is hard to get, even right. for those who really need it. So, yeah. But you cannot get it unless you are qualified. Absolutely. Well, thank you, and congratulations for working for such a wonderful organization. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. We, we've been working very hard on this, and there will be action in the district, I think. We, uh, there was a hearing uh, in the spring of last year, and I went to the hearing, and to my great surprise, you had to wait outside the hearing room. So many people were there and knew about it. I don't know how they knew about it because it was certainly not publicized. So the district, Maryland has action. They came close, but it didn't get out of committee. But I think it will come out of committee yeah, next I year. Too. Yes, why don't the gentleman and then the woman next to him. Thank you very much. Uh, Larry Checo and Diane, thank you very much because uh, I've actually talked on your show, I've called you in and you've accepted my calls and actually Good. you read something that I sent in too about the banking industry. I think we were in, in unison on that. But uh, since politics were brought up, in addition to the right to die, there are a lot of other serious issues in this country that I think most of us in Washington feel are being blocked by politics. How do you get grassroots movement? on other issues, on any issue, your issue and other issues. How, what's the best way? Because I try to do that, and I often run up against uh, stumbling blocks. I think uh, speaking to groups like this, as I have been doing all over the country, and there is not uh, maybe the ones who disagree with my perspective on the right to choose simply leave, and I don't hear from them. But every single person who's come up to me has said, I cannot tell you how much I agree with what you're saying. What can we do? Now, I'll tell you what's happening. In St. Louis, you're going to laugh at this, there is a group now called cupcakes, and death. Neighbors and friends and relatives come together for dinners, for talk, 
and they let each other know exactly what they want. They've signed papers, but sometimes papers don't do it for you. But they let each other know exactly what they want and what they're working towards and what they expect. In that way, you get whole neighborhoods. I think that's great, and apparently that's spreading. So you don't have to have a group as large as this. You may call your good friends and neighbors together and simply raise the issue. Now, the other question I've been asked is, how do I, as a child of elderly parents, begin to raise this issue? And I would say that the way to begin the discussion, if you are in that situation, is simply to say, you know, I've been thinking an awful lot about my own life, my own longevity, my own health. I'm starting to think about how to make plans for myself. And I wonder if you have to simply open the discussion. This country is death averse. We do not want to talk about something every single person alive now is going to face at one point or another. So why not talk about it? Why not have it as part of the reality of our conversation? We rejoice in birth. We rejoice in weddings. Sometimes we rejoice in divorce. <laughs> but we're all going to face death. So we might as well talk about it. I think we have time before Diane has to catch a plane for two questions. I think there was a question here and, and a woman in the back. Maybe you could each give your questions, and then Diane can respond to both. My question is similar to one that you covered, and that is, how can we accelerate the adoption of the death with dignity laws? You mentioned that California might be the tipping state, but um, there, this woman mentioned- Just six now currently in existence. The reason I say that California may be the tipping point is because once California passed gay marriage, and many people are <coughs> arguing that gay marriage may have set a pattern for how laws then move through various states. Um, and I would not be surprised, though I have no way of predicting. I know that Maryland is taking it up again. Jamie Raskin has already called me about that. I know that it has come up in Virginia. I think you will begin to see it pop up. It may not come to the fore the first, second, or third time, but those who are working for it I promise you, are not going to give up because people feel it is a right. So I think it's going to move. We'll see. Maybe not in my lifetime. I'll be 80 in September, which is why I am <laughs> stepping away from the microphone. I think it's time for a younger voice for younger, fresher ideas to come forward. And that's why I decided to step away. Your Diane, last we're going to miss you so much. Oh, <laughs> Two joking. hours every day. Thank you, Jessica. 
a younger voice. <laughs> You know, I can just barely yeah, know hear you if you can on. hold that microphone a little bit closer. No. Is it on? Why don't we just bring the other microphone? Sorry about that. Should I press it? Oh, no. Hi, I'm Bei oh. Fong. <laughs> I'm with Radio Free Asia, but I'm here in a purely personal capacity. Um, I'm a big fan of yours. Thank you. And I just wanted to say I, I'm recently married, and uh, even without the decades of experience being with my partner, I just felt so moved by your description of sitting by your husband's bedside um, during his last 10 days. And I'm wondering if you might be able to bring us a little deeper into your decision not to help him with it. I'm sure there was much more to it than just feeling like you are a public figure and, uh, and your agreement to the doctor. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can tell us a bit more about that. I would um, have, I, you know, you hear so many people say, for God's sake, just put a pillow over my head. You've heard that expression so much. I wouldn't have had the courage to do that. I really would not. I could not take my husband's life. I think that Dr. Freed was worried that I felt so strongly about his right to go that I might do something like that. I couldn't do that. I just couldn't. And I have talked with so many other people who have said they were confronted by the same issue and could not do that. Thank you for that question. Before we close, I want to read you something. And of course, I will not disclose the name. You would, many of you would know the name. And I want you to know that this was written in the early 1960s. The person writes, the only dark spot in my life is my poor father, who is truly suffering more and more each day. He has been in the hospital these past weeks, is kept alive only by drugs, and then kept out of pain by more drugs. It's horrible, and I cannot at these times believe that there is a benevolent God watching over us, for if so, he would spare my father this final agony and the humiliation of dying in this manner. I should rather see him dead any day to this indescribable suffering. You cannot imagine, and pray God, you will never see what such a disease is like. And one can only ask why a man so good and so kind all his life, a truly Christian person. 60 years ago, and we're still in this place. So I thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, too. Very and there are books outside.